You're listening to Podcast PXN, PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo. Let's do this. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Podcast PXN, episode 108. I'm one of your hosts, Roshan, a.k.a. Roro, and I'm joined by Dan, the Halo Man, Daniel Pendle, and the host of Large Popcorn, Christian Macias. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. How are you guys doing today? Great. Nice, nice. I, I should be off playing Dread right now. <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and more Metro Dread talk at the games we're playing, of course, but... Before we get into that, let me thank you guys, everyone who's watching. Just a reminder, uh, you could catch us live each and every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. Just search up Podcast PXN on Twitch and on YouTube, and you shall find us there. Our topic of the show is the game uh, is our Game of the Year watch. We're going to talk about our personal Game of the Years, what we think will be on the official list at Jeff Keighley's Game Awards as well. But first, the show always starts with the PXN News of the Week. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. And now, finally, guys, it is officially official. I feel like we've been talking about this particular trilogy for a while now, and Rockstar has finally come out and said, yes, it's coming. You guessed it, Grand Theft Auto, the trilogy, the definitive edition, (laughs) has been officially announced, and it's coming soon to consoles and PC. So on October 8th, Rockstar announced via a tweet on Twitter, they did a little montage of the three games uh, with a nice little jazz... Maybe, I'm not sure what kind of genre of music it is, but it was very soothing. I like that. <laughs> but uh, they announced that it's going to be coming to consoles and PCs, as I earlier stated. Rockstar Games is going to reveal more details in the coming weeks. There are multiple gameplay and visual improvements, but Rockstar states that all the games still, quote, retain their classic look and feel, unquote. Apparently, the games are also coming to mobile next year, 2022. Um... This also comes with the news that Rockstar is also removing all existing versions of each game that are included in this trilogy from digital storefronts as well. So if you, so you're just going to have to buy the trilogy, basically, (laughs) if you want to be playing these games. Um, But yeah, uh, Daniel, now that this has officially been announced, now that they've also, they still have a couple of things that they need to show off and tell us, but from what we, from what little that we know how you feeling, especially with the quote, retain their classic look and feel. And what does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? Um, I, I hope it's not just like another port because I really want something more than that. And I'll be very disappointed if it's just like, you know, here's a port of Grand Theft Auto San Andreas for the 20th time because we got we got that last gen, like on 360, we got um, a port of it. Uh, so I, I was really hoping for like updated visuals and like, you know, improve it uh, a little bit. It doesn't have to be like a full blown remake like Resident Evil 4, because obviously this is a trilogy of three games. But like maybe like a Mass Effect, um, uh, whatchamacallit, I forget the name of it. I, it's escaped me. But Remaster? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the legendary legendary, the legendary edition. edition. Yes. Oh, yeah. Legend- yeah. Yes. Like if, if it was like that, that, like that would that. be cool. <laughs> yeah. Because at least that's a little bit of a you know step up. It's not just copy and paste. But yeah, uh, I'll be interested in seeing how much this costs too. Seventy dollars? Eh, I don't know. That's the rumor, right? Yes, it it's, is. Yeah, full title. Yeah. Hmm. I, don't know. I would need to see it before I can justify any kind of price point. I think because the 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 wording that Ro just read uh, read on like the game's description seems very like paradoxical. They talk about how it has gameplay and visual improvements while still retaining the classic look and feel. So which which one is it? Are we <laughs> are we improving it or are we uh, retaining the classic look and feel? I I, I don't right. know and, and until we see it I can't I can't well, speak on you go ahead. Oh sorry. I I didn't mean to cr- cut you off Christian, but like what you said is exactly like uh it does that mean like we're we're getting rid of all the previous versions of the game so like sometimes p- fans of series don't like when that happens for instance halo the master chief collection had some visual issues with halo ce and halo 2 anniversary and stuff like that that they have now addressed which we can talk about later but like if they do that situation where they're pulling all the original games and these new enhanced versions or whatever do something that fans don't like, like you can't get the original version now. Like, ugh. Yeah. yeah, and that's the thing too, because originally I was very 
like kind of up in arms about like uh the way we retain the way we think about retaining games like video games just like we don't have like proper retention for these but like oh rockstar's removing these games like that seems like a very bad thing uh and then i was ha- having i was on point in progress the podcast uh last week and frank was talking about how like this is actually a good thing um, because the the what's on the stores currently were these um, ports that Rockstar had like outsourced to other companies that just did like a terrible job and that are apparently still broken. So mm-hmm. it's like, well, we can pull this broken product uh, out and then give them like this this new product that we had built in house. And that like I'm actually, I think is kind of a, a good uh, pro consumer kind of move. I don't know what you guys think about that. That yeah, that that does sound. Good. I didn't know. I didn't realize that it wasn't a rock star thing. That the the ports that are already exist that already existed on these platforms are. Um, so it's good that they're making their own versions and getting rid of the ones that aren't up to snuff by their standards. And hopefully, whatever comes out with this trilogy is better and it is up to the standards that uh, that they want and that gamers, I guess, uh, deserve. I don't even know if deserve is the right word, but uh, yeah. I'm gonna ask a quick question that I was asked uh, on the sh- on point in progress. Uh, do we think that driving mechanics are we gonna accelerate with X or R two? What, what do we think oh here? God, oh. X, X. Yeah. Now, now, is it X on PlayStation or X on? No. Oh <laughs> gosh, I, I didn't even realize. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're right, Dad. <laughs> yeah, I a, I guess. Okay. Oh, right. yeah. Now, now I okay. Now I'm like, no. yeah. That that'd be <laughs> weird on keyboard. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That would be cool. weird to accelerate with A again. Uh, so maybe, I don't know, maybe update Maybe that. that's one of the gameplay improvements that they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Modernized yeah. controls. Yeah. Hopefully. I can't, I, I still can't. That's another reason why I wasn't super into GTA V. I was just like, the controls for, for me in that game were just so wonky. Uh, but yeah. moving on to our next story. G4 has finally been announced. What, 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 what did I say something? I'm just laughing because the way we we leave this store is you just like oh. dissing GTA 5. <laughs> All right, moving on. Yeah. All right, anyways. <laughs> oh, man. But yes, G4 is back, officially. They've been teasing it, as I'll, as I'll read here. After more than a year of teasing and occasional streams, G4 will make its return as a linear TV channel on November 16th. So far, the channel is confirmed to appear on Comcast slash Xfinity, uh, Verizon Fios, Cox, and... Uh, Filio, Filio, I guess these are all American streaming or channels. I've never heard of most of these, so I may be pronouncing some of them wrong. So forgive me. Uh, since announcing its return last year, G4 put out some reunion content plus occasional streams on Twitch, where the network will maintain a multi-year promotional and commercial partnership. Uh, when G4 comes back next month, some of the programming and hosts should be very familiar. Attack of the Show is back with host Kevin Piera. Uh, did I say that right? P- Piera? Pereira. Yeah. Pereira? Okay. Pereira. Well, X-Play, no longer X-Play, is again uh, in the review business under the auspices of Adam Sessler. <laughs> I don't know why I had a brain for it. You there. got it. <laughs> of Adam Sessler. Uh, along with some uh, esports-focused series, G4 has also obtained U.S. streaming rights to Sasuke Uchiha. I'm sorry, Sasuke aka Ninja Warrior, uh, for old school fans who watch the original Japanese version on its yes, cable channel. So, good. so, you guys, I have a feeling that you guys are pretty familiar with G4, just based on how, what I was reading there, you seem to get some reaction out of you. Me, personally, I haven't had a huge history with it. So I'm excited for it to be returning, getting to, you know, enjoy these revamped versions of uh, classic shows, I guess. Um, but for you guys who have experienced G4, how excited are you guys for it to be making a return and it to be on actual television? Christian, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I I think I'm pretty excited. Like th- this G4, I feel like a lot of gamers have like a history of watching it. Like it was just like my my comfort food of like I, this is kind of like the original. Like I want to hear some people talk about games, and this was the only way that I could really get it outside from like a, a like a literary format, like a magazine, was to watch G4. And so to see it come back, I think is really cool. Um, I want, I'm most excited to see how it's going to evolve rather than just like, oh, it's like the, the, all the old stuff back, which uh, I'm excited to see again. But I like 
we're older now we want like we're, we're used to new forms of entertainment so i'm excited to see how they're going to evolve one of the things that i was worried about was that if it was only going to be a cable thing i'm not sure how much i was going to watch of g4 uh but adam yeah, sensor did tweet yeah. out that it, it is coming to twitch as well so mm-hmm. I think having it be on uh, on an, an internet platform, I think is going to do a lot for like the gaming gaming space. So I'm I'm excited to check it out again. Yeah, yeah, that's super important, Christian. Like you're saying, like if this was only on cable again, like th- this wouldn't like I wouldn't be able to watch it. I'm sure, Christian. Do you have cable at your place, or do you just do? I have, I have YouTube TV. Same as me. So like. <laughs> people like us we wouldn't have access to it regardless if they didn't stream it on twitch so that's awesome that they're going to do that um and yeah adam sessler is super cool i loved uh all of his stuff on x play with morgan webb uh kevin Pereira is hilarious i love him as well uh and of course i grew up watching every single gttv episode with jeff Keeley, and now jeff Keeley is the f- biggest badass in gaming right now putting on the game awards every year and all the other events that he does so super super cool uh to see this come back and hopefully hopefully it does well i want to see it continue to thrive bring back olivia munn for one episode yeah <laughs> actually I think she was in talks to come back, yeah. I thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Only time will tell. Yeah. Maybe on November 16th, we shall find out. Here we go to our next story of the show, or our next uh, PXN news story. A vow reportedly has destructible environments and is deep into pre-production. So Daniel asked me to add this to the stories. Yes. I, I missed it. Yes. But I know Daniel is a huge Obsidian fan, so we're going to dive into this one for him. Uh, I'm reading from IGN, Cat Bailey. Uh, she writes, a little more than a year since its original announcement, we still know uh, co- comparatively little about Avowed, the new first-person RPG from Obsidian based in the Pillars of Eternity universe. However, a new report by Windows Central appears to shed light on the project, revealing that it's well into pre-production and that it will feature many elements of Pillars of Eternity fans will be familiar with. They reportedly reportedly include familiar spells such as Jolting Touch and uh, Heated Caress. Is that correct, Daniel? (laughs) I guess. I don't know. (laughs) Um, As well as creatures such as uh, Zorpis. (laughs) <laughs> or Zorips is what I'm going to go with on that one. Uh, the report repeatedly uh, compares a vow to Skyrim and Oblivion, describing it as undoubtedly Obsidian's take on the Elder Scrolls. It may go as far to include indestructible environments with fire spells, leaving areas coated in flames. So, Daniel, yes. does that get you hyped? Yeah. It being compared to Elder Scrolls and that yes i very much love that comparison and like it, it's very similar to like bethesda game studios for instance they has historically switched between elder scrolls and fallout like back and forth uh between fallout 3 and uh oblivion and and uh elder scrolls 5 skyrim and fallout 4 very similar here because they're going from outer worlds which is very much a fallout clone and now they're going and making a skyrim clone essentially but i do think it's gonna be like their own thing because like from the way they're describing it it feels like it's going to have like that humor and like that omniance i guess that outer worlds has but it's going to uh incorporate more like skyrim gameplay elements and and feel more like a skyrim you know successor or whatever you want to call it um and it's it's also interesting uh nebellion who he tweets out all kinds of stuff on twitter he put on there that uh it's going to be a first person action rpg which is obvious but it's going to feature multiple class play styles including two-handed combat and destructible environments so like two-handed like the interesting thing is, is like multiple class play styles. Does that mean you're going to clu- choose like what classes you get to play as, or is it going to be like a skill tree like Skyrim had, mm-hmm. where you have your two handed, your one handed, and ranged and all that? Uh, I'm just so excited to learn more about this <laughs> game. I I love Obsidian, yes. and give me some more Obsidian. I love it so much. Uh, Christian, how are you excited for? Uh... About are you an Obsidian fan uh, fanboy like uh, like Daniel here? <laughs> no, I, I I missed a lot of Obsidian games. Like 
I've, I, as Dan was talking, I realized, like, huh, I've never really had, like, multiple consoles or multiple means to, like, play all these games until, like, now my my, my adult life. So Obsidian is just, like, kind of those peripheral devs that I kind of missed a lot of these games on. I had to, I had to Google some of these games. Um, so, like, I'm always down for any, like, to try out an RPG. Like, I'm a little bit trepidatious. Not all Western RPGs, like, necessarily speak to me. Especially when, not when, like, we're talking about, like, a, a Bethesda clone kind of game. I tried playing Oblivion uh, back on the PS3 days, and I, I tried Skyrim as well. And they weren't for me a- at that time. I would gladly try them again. Maybe I will uh, with like I don't know, on my PC or something. But from it's what everywhere. I've seen, on, <laughs> I, I know, right? I can play like anywhere now. From what I've seen of people about people talking about this and just like just reading a little bit about like the dual wielding like powers and stuff uh, with with your hands, I think this seems like a, a game that like quite possibly like might be pretty cool to check out at, at the bare minimum so just based yeah. off discussions that like dan had on twitter like i'm cautiously optimistic about this game definitely yeah uh it it seems really cool i i am like i'm more on christian side for this one i just obsidian is just not a developer that i paid a lot of attention to when gaming in my youth and as i got older i just never i was never attached to those those games because I just never tried them out when I was younger. But reading this stuff, it does seem does seem neat. So maybe I will check it out when the time comes and when it comes around the corner. Uh, Daniel still keeps telling me that I should be playing Outer Outer Worlds. Yes. Outer Worlds, yes. And I still no, still haven't beaten it yet. Instead. And, and then <laughs> Christian will come over and tell me to play Outer Worlds. <laughs> and then and then I just go play Destiny instead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but moving on to a game you all should be playing, Metroid Dread is the highest grossing Metroid game launch in UK history. I am reading from uh, Game Industry. Uh, Metroid Dread, or GameIndustry.biz, sorry, got to give it, the full name in there. Uh, Metroid Dread on Nintendo Switch is the highest grossing Metroid game launch in the UK to date, eclipsing the original Metroid Prime on the GameCube. In terms of unit sales, Metroid Dread was less than 1,000 units away from overtaking Metroid Prime. Of course, digital data is missing, and it's safe to say that Metroid Dread sold over 1,000 downloads in the UK. Therefore, we can confidently state that Metroid Dread also the, is also the fastest Metroid game to date. Uh, the game sold three and a half times more copies at launch then the last two-day Metroid games, Metroid Samus Returns, which launched on the 3DS in 2017 after the Switch had, uh, had I think, sold out is what they meant to say. I, or maybe I copied it wrong. Um, after the Switch had some out. Yeah, it, maybe sold out is what they're trying to say. My mistake. Uh, it's good news for Metroid, uh, which is one of Nintendo's smaller franchises, but has dedicated has a dedicated and vocal fan base. It is the fifth biggest Nintendo Switch launch of the year behind Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury, The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword HD, uh, Monster Hunter Rise, and Pokemon Snap. So, Christian, I know you are playing Metroid Dread right now. Um, are you enjoying Well, we'll talk about how much you're enjoying it yeah, later. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> but uh, how did the numbers... Uh, are you surprised by it being number five on the best Nintendo games or... And what do you think it means for the uh, the series as a whole? Yeah. First of all, uh, behind Bowser's Fury is like tragically such a crime because this game <laughs> objectively, objectively, not even subjectively, like rocks. Honestly, too, like all, I, all of the ahead. games on this list, I think it should be above. Um, but uh, we'll talk about that after. I'm sure. sure. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I'm. I am so happy uh, that this game is is doing and selling well because that just means like. Nintendo is going to probably look at, hopefully, going to start looking at possibly getting more Metroid games out there. Like, that's... They don't put out Metroid games because, like, they notoriously, like, don't sell that well. But And, and I don't know what it is if it's our climate of, like, uh, kind of a lack of first-party um, Switch games coming out or or what, or if just this game is just, like, different because it, it does feel special. Um... Yeah, having having high sales numbers like just means means a lot. I'm sure it means a lot to Nintendo, but also means more to, to the fan base, like uh, the possibility of getting more Metroid games. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to like the next story that's kind of intrinsically mm-hmm. tied into this Metroid Dread discussion. Okay, uh, Daniel. Yeah, how how do you feel about it being selling so well in the UK, being the fastest Metroid game? Are you surprised by these numbers? And, and again, uh... what do you think it means for the series? 
Yeah, I, I don't think I'm surprised by the numbers because I, I think a lot of people have been very hyped about this and the previews have been very uh, positive coming into this. So uh, I think it's something that people have been looking forward to for a long time that uh, own a Switch. And uh, actually, honestly, like you guys were talking about it on Twitter and I was like, man, I, I really was already getting interested just by seeing like the gameplay. And I've never played a Metroid game before. So I'm like, man, this could be a good spot to just jump in and just see you know get my feet wet so to speak and uh hopefully we get a metroid prime 4 uh reveal sometime soon for people who want to see that collection dude (laughs) yeah that's true that's been rumored for a while but nothing thus far but yeah if that collection ever comes that would totally be a spot that i would jump into it because obviously i can play the whole trilogy and be excited for metroid prime 4 whenever that comes out but yeah i don't know retro take your time people the fans will wait you know just make a good game mm-hmm. so yeah. Heck yeah um what i was going to say about the list uh the christian with the like bowser's fury and all that kind of stuff i guess right. it really isn't that surprising because those games those games are, are great games but they're not like First, they are first party, but I, they're not new in any stretch. There's like Pokemon Snap, I yeah. guess, but that's a remake. And then there's Skyward Sword, which is a, a HD remaster. And it's like Metroid Samus or uh, Metroid uh, Dread is like one of the more original Nintendo games that's come out in a while. So I could definitely see it hopefully rising above those as the year goes on, hopefully, because a lot it's of the games. The- yeah. It's not the same level as, as like caliber, or like exactly. evolu- evolution of the series in like the same way. Yeah, like you. Just, I mean, yeah. a remaster and kind of an iteration of of another three D Mario. So, yeah. yeah. So, so hopefully it gets the love that it. I think it deserves. Um, but it seems like the series as a whole is getting a lot more love as Dread came out. Uh, the series has seen a spike in sales uh, all over the Nintendo <laughs> ecosystem. So obviously on the Switch. It's selling like hotcakes on this uh, eShop. But on the Wii U, Metroid Fusion, Metroid Zero Mission, and Metroid Prime Trilogy and Super Metroid were all within the top 10 best selling games, uh, I think, uh, yeah, on the week of October 11th. And on the 3DS, uh, Metroid Sam's Returns was number three on that week. So, yeah, people are going back, checking out those games to get ready for Metroid Dread or maybe beating Metroid Dread. Like, hey, I want more Metroid. And yeah, they're going out and purchasing some more Metroid. So that's. I hope that, like we're talking, like we're saying, hopefully that sets a, sends a signal to Nintendo saying that people are interested in this franchise and we want more of it. So, and Christian, you were going to say something uh, to tie into this story. Yeah, and this is just speculation uh, on my account. So I guess take that with with a grain <laughs> of salt. But like for me, that that says to me that people like are either playing Dread or yeah, or like you said, maybe even getting ready for Dread. But like this just shows that like if you invest in a in a quality title like like Metroid Dread, uh, people will go out and and kind of want to support this franchise. So whether it be like future games, hopefully Nintendo, <laughs> or even like the past games, like you are gonna build a fan base by investing in your property. So I I think this people uh, voting with their wallets that's that's the the language everyone wants to use for, for yeah. this right. I think people voting with their wallets with uh, with not just Dread, but the whole franchise in, in general, I think is really going to spark uh, some kind of change or inspire some kind of, I don't know, put put the the fire underneath Nintendo to be like, you know what, maybe we need to give Metroid more of a second chance, uh, more like a spotlight Slater down the road of maybe games not, like this This was like 14 years in the making, man. <laughs> so, it's insane. And maybe some opportunities to get some more Metroid titles, if, if anything. And I think figures like this might, might lead to that yeah definitely hope you are right christian i would love some more metroid as someone who is relatively new to the franchise i'm already in love with it and as, as we as we hinted we'll talk about metroid dread later in the show but moving on to another franchise that's doing really really well final fantasy 14 surpasses 24 million players becomes the most profitable final fantasy game in the series i'm reading from ign matt kim writes during a recent hands-on preview event for the upcoming Final Fantasy XIV and Walker expansion, director uh, Naoki Ni- 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 Yoshida. I guess oh, I said that right. You're getting all the crazy names. I today. know. <laughs> how do you how do you say his first name? Do you guys know uh, Naoki? 
I know it's Yoshida, but Naoki? Yeah, Naoki Yoshida-san? Naoki. Naoki Yoshida. I think that sounds right. Apologies, Mr. Yoshida. <laughs> uh, revealed that uh, Square I think Enix... I Naoki's spot... a, woman, a woman, if I'm not mistaken. Right? So, so nope, Naoki. I am wrong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, thinking so, I'm thinking about someone else. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> revealed that Square Enix Bakula MMORPG recently has surpassed 24 million players. Furthermore, it is the most profitable Final Fantasy game in the series. Speaking to press uh, in, digital, in a digital preview event, Yoshida... Uh, revealed that the player count has hit 24 million players 11 years after Final Fantasy XIV was first released. 11 years this game has been out. Holy cow. In a chart uh, Yoshida shared with the press, Final Fantasy XIV players count back to 2015 uh, was 4 million registered players. The number hit 10 million by the time the third expansion Stormblood was released in 2017 before doubling in the next four years. First of all, wow, I didn't realize how long Final Fantasy XIV has been out. Um, second, that's awesome for them. Like, I, I know that they had a rocky launch uh, at the start of this, so it's great that they've been able to turn it around and make it something that is the most profitable Final Fantasy ever, which I guess isn't so surprising as it is the only one that kind of makes you pay to play it every every month. Um, but yeah, uh, Daniel, what do you? How you? Are you surprised that Final Fantasy XIV is doing so well in this day and age? Or is it just like, of course, of course Final Fantasy XIV is still doing good. I mean, it only took them 14 titles to finally get the <laughs> highest. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, no, it's great for uh, fans of Final Fantasy. And it's great to see that this franchise is stuck around for so long. But like one of the coolest things that I think uh, as an outside uh, viewer of this franchise, so to speak, because I don't really you know get into the Final Fantasy games as much, is... Every single final, or not every single, but a lot of the Final Fantasy games are like very different games. So, like, this is an MMO, MMO RPG, but then they have, uh, like, I think the new, new one that they announced is like a completely different type of game. I remember us talking about it when they announced it, but I can't remember what type of game it is. But, like, it's I just like love sort of, yes, like, that's yeah, right. I, I know which one you're talking about. Yes, like, I just like how they're you know expanding the franchise into more you know different avenues that's if there's one criticism i have of halo it's that it doesn't do enough of that they do they did a little bit of that with halo wars but i would love to see like more expansion of uh the franchise like what final fantasy does and kind of dip their toes into different genres and such uh christian are you a final fantasy 14 fan <laughs> no but th th my friends lord do they love reminding me that i should be playing this game every <laughs> week it's like you can play up to level 60 for free let me let me, let me show yeah. you like, you know what i clickety clickety games like they, they aren't for me i'm sorry but i appreciate you i'll watch you stream it like as as much as you stream but otherwise i i don't think i'll be able to play it but like this doesn't surprise me though like for a long time Final Fantasy XIV has brought like quality teams uh, to write these expansion packs, and I, and I know based off the people that I that I like kind of talk to about like their frustrations with like games like WoW or whatever, like mm -hmm. there was a there was a space where people like wanted a, a, a quality MMO RPG that they weren't getting with their previous RPGs, and this is where Final Fantasy came in and kind of swept that market, especially since we're all at home right now. We're still probably at home for the most part, like. And then having these free trials, Final Fantasy XIV set themselves up so well to just have a place in that market and just to convince people to, like, come on over, try to look at all these expansions we have. We're just launching all this new content, and, like, they're doing a fantastic job of, like, stringing them along. And from what I've seen from my friend's stream and from what I've read about, you know, online, it's some quality, like, stuff. Like, it's, like, actually moving pieces of content. I don't think I'll play them. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> MMRs just aren't my thing. I'm, like, I'm sorry, but, like, respect massive respect to the teams at ff14 <laughs> yes definitely good job you guys over at the final fantasy 14 team well done again i'm i'm also not a, i've tried it before i've tried final fantasy 14 uh once before um and it was fun for a bit but i just don't think i could sink that much time into another game like that like destiny i guess that requires you to play it like all the time um but yeah i i Wish them all the best, and their I wish them continued success. 
uh, because they're I, obviously doing something good over there. Yeah. I remember I I I had a, a crush a long time ago who was like really into RuneScape, and that was like my first foray into like kind of like MMOs. Like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna get into RuneScape too to like, you know, yeah. <laughs> get my RuneScape. So, like, yeah, yeah, get my, my way in with this girl, right? And like, I I played for like an hour. I was like, this is not worth it. So worth it. <laughs> it was... Oh man, yeah. things will do for love. <laughs> Moving on to the next story, Disney teases a Star Wars video game announcement for December. Disney and Lucasfilm have teased a Star Wars video game announcement for December as part of a publishing campaign that will reveal new Star Wars products every Tuesday for the rest of the year. Um, and yeah, apparently on 10 of this calendar, um, they're, they're teasing a video game. What could it be? Uh, could it be something as big as Jedi Fallen Order 2? Could it be something as small as a as a mobile game? We we, we honestly don't know. Um, but there's been a lot of Star Wars uh, video games. Like Star Wars Hunters is coming soon. They remade uh, Kodor as well. Mm. So Star Wars is getting a, getting a lot of love in the video game space these days. So here's hoping that it's something for us to get excited about. Uh, Daniel, what what do you think? this could be do you think it's something huge or do you think it's going to be like a, a little bit more yeah on the down low <laughs> i uh, i'm not sure uh it, it is interesting now that ea's exclusivity deal is starting to run out i think it's through this year maybe next year it expires uh but yeah i think we're going to start seeing a lot more star wars games come out now that ea has lost exclusivity for that and um i think there was a rumor quantic dream was making a star wars game so like that could pop back up uh i would love to see star wars jedi fallen order to pop back up that would be great um uh, and kind of see that officially announced because that will have been i guess in december that'll have been two years since the first one came out so it's possible um but i feel like for st like star wars jedi fallen order i feel like that would be better suited for like a bigger stage like you know the game, game awards, awards right <laughs> right exactly yeah so i don't know apparently this uh this announcement is set to take uh set to take place before the game awards like a couple of days before so it's not going to be in sync with with that but i agree like something as big as jedi fallen order probably shouldn't be announced on a like a little tweet or however they're announcing these yeah agreed but now, sure. now I'm just like kind of now I'm kind of thinking because it I think Fallen Order two just in general feels like too soon for it that to be announced. I don't think that's like quite ready to to get shown off yet. Um, I mean, who knows what? Um, gosh, I, respawn. I almost said RuneScape. <laughs> who knows how far along they are? But like now I'm kind of thinking like I mean, there, it's not outside the realm of possibility of having like some kind of you know formal written announcement with like a, like a some kind of logo reveal on the tenth and then have like. You know, tune into the Game Awards to see the full reveal. Like hmm. that could be a way to get kind of people more eyes on the Game Awards. But who knows? I want to know when uh, Star Wars: The Force Unleashed is coming back, and maybe maybe <laughs> this is this is the time. Yes, I'm gonna bring it back. Good so, game. Cool. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to our next story, Ghost Recon, Ghost Recon Frontline multiplayer test delayed indefinitely. I'm reading from GameSpot, the Ghost Recon Frontline closed testing period has been delayed indefinitely. Ubisoft announced today that it decided it would be best to postpone the testing period for reasons it did not explain, though it might have something to do with the backlash to the game's announcement. The development, quote, the development team is dedicated to creating the best experience possible, Ubisoft said. Thank you for your ongoing support. <laughs> More details will be shared on the new date for Frontline's testing period at some point in the future. Frontline was announced as part of Ubisoft's 20th anniversary Ghost Recon stream. The game's announcement trailer was ratioed hard by viewers <laughs> with 17,000 dislikes compared to 5,000 <laughs> likes. Um, so yeah, we talked a little bit about Frontline, uh, I think last week, and how we were kind of very... I think we were on the 17,000 dislike side uh, <laughs> more than anything. Uh, and now it's been uh, postponed indefinitely, at least the test has. And maybe it's for the reasons that this article alluded to, to maybe do something more creative with it. Or maybe it, it's because they don't want to do it anymore. I don't know. Christian, what, what did you think? Or do you think it's anything to make a fuss about? Or it's just, you know, they're going to take, take their time a bit more. First of all, 
I've never disliked a video in my entire life. <laughs> I've, you know, I've wanted to. I've thought about it. But what a what a beautifully passive aggressive thing it is to like, without any words, just explain how I feel about this one product. Yeah. No, I, I think it's. I I think it's. I mean, it sucks. <laughs> it sucks that they have to like yeah. close down. You know, postpone it indefinitely. But like, it is what it is. Like when people are not interested in a product because. We talked about this last week. Your products seem uh, too samey. They seem too stale. There's not enough like innovation, not just in your own products, but like the kind of like genre you're exploring. It's just it, it just isn't enough, you know. And I feel like gamers, are, I think at this point, are looking for like fresh new takes on kind of games. And I don't think Frontline or some of the other Ubisoft titles are, are seem to be like the kinds of experiences people want. Then again, we have games like Far Cry who are, who are like selling well and reviewing fairly well. So yeah. what do I know, I guess? But yeah. <laughs> Christian, I totally see you now as like a guy that goes on YouTube just disliking videos like, take that, I get to dislike you again. I don't know. Never done it. Never done it. It I'm seems kidding. too harsh. <laughs> Passive aggressive. <laughs> dislike. Uh, no, I, I, I think it... Like, do you guys think that it's possible that this game never shows back up again? Like, they just forget it Took ever happened. The rug? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I almost, <laughs> I almost feel like they might do that. Like, they're just like, all right, let's just take our losses and like move this content to like something else. Like, take the content, like some of the maps or something, into siege or I don't know, just repurposing the content in some way. It almost feels okay. like that. Yeah, total abandonment would seem would seem like too much of a loss of money for yeah. how, uh, like if they're already gonna do like some kind of multiplayer test for it, yeah. repurposing those assets into some kind of DLC for games that like are existing and popular seems like a move where it would be like okay, we're gonna cut our losses but still be able to make some kind of uh, profit off uh, all this time invested. That's actually a good idea, Dan. Yeah, I think that would be interesting, but I don't know. Who knows? It's Ubisoft, so they could do something crazy like make it a Far Cry game. <laughs> <laughs> DLC for Far Cry. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, I would. I. I don't know what I what I should say or what I, how I feel. Um, I. I. Like you said, I don't think that they should completely abandon it. Maybe they could repurpose, like you said, what they have made into something else. Because as we also said, everything that they've made kind of kind of samey. So it might just fit perfectly into something else. They could just, like just drop it into any of their games and. We wouldn't know that it was from something else. Um, so yeah, hopefully they figure something out, and when they are ready to reveal whatever this is, that it isn't met with complete, you know, <laughs> hate, and you know they, they make something that they're proud of, I guess. And all- yeah, that's that's go ahead, Dan. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. No, because I I wrote brought up a good point. Like I. I, I feel I feel bad almost because I I never want to <laughs> see companies or I never want I never want to see teams I should say like these developers like I never want to see people fail right to, yeah. to be ratioed so hard by people <laughs> online but at the same time like we have to communicate in some kind of way to like listen the the, the products you're putting out there like just Definitely. aren't up to up to standards so yeah hopefully if they can repurpose it into something else that people want to see in all seriousness ro you're totally spot on like they could put this in any of their games like almost all of their <laughs> games are like the same like they yeah. just have different skins essentially but we shall see. We shall see. Will well will we see? Only time will tell. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the next story, Pokemon Legends RCS isn't quite fully open world, confirms a Pokemon company. I'm reading from Games Radar. Uh, Hope Bell Belgium Belgium writes. <laughs> uh, Pokemon Legends RCS isn't fully open world. The Pokemon company has confirmed following a fan discovery. Following the reports, Pokemon Legends RCS may not be fully open world and might instead have open world areas. The Pokemon company has since confirmed that this is actually the case in a statement to Kotaku. Uh, the statement reads, quote, in Pokemon Legends Arceus, Jubilee Village will serve as the base of surveying missions. After receiving an assignment or request and preparing for the next excursion, players will set out from the village to study on, uh, to study one of the various open areas in Hisui, Hisui region. After they finish the uh, the survey work players will need to return once more to prepare for their next task. We look forward to sharing more information about exploring the history region soon. Um, yeah, so the key terms in the statement seem to be 
uh, quote, one of the various open world areas of the Hisui region, and Juby Life will serve as a base, which pretty much confirms one brand's previous uh, theory about Pokemon Legends RCS having segmented open areas. Um, yeah, so as the article writes, similar to Monster Hunter and you know, Blade Chronicles. So Monster Hunter, I'm able to do the comparison to. So yeah, even looking at this picture in the article, I can't say that I'm completely let down <laughs> by that. Uh, it is a bit of a bummer, for sure, that you can't just explore it completely. Um, but Christian, how does how does it how does the Pokemon uh, Legends RCS not being completely open world and then doing something a little bit more akin to Monster Hunter make you feel? Does it lessen your hype for the game if you had any hype in the first place? Weirdly enough, it kind of doesn't bother me. Like uh, I th- I think people for the most part like uh, have faith in the kind of quality games that you know these these team like these Pokemon games uh, eventually turn out to be. Um, I wonder. I, I, the question is, I wonder why, like, they chose not to do open world. Like, I wonder if that's just like a design philosophy that they choose to do for this title, or if just you know limitations of Switch hardware. But either way, I think at the end of the day, what's going to really judge it is based off the quality of these open world segments. As to like, if there's enough care and density in these like segmented areas, I think it's totally it's going to be totally fine uh, for when we eventually come and like get play it and get to experience it with our own hands. Like, kind of a bummer though, because I think every Pokemon fan dream is to have like an actual <laughs> game. But maybe, maybe with the Switch Pro, who knows? Yeah, I, I I totally agree with what you said, Christian. Like, the thing that like I I kind of you know again this kind of goes back to my obsession with Obsidian, but the Outer Worlds is a perfect example of that because it's a very much a fallout clone but it's not a, a completely open world map it's open areas you go to planets and that those planets have open world areas um but that that game does it perfectly where you have these spaces that feel really large uh obviously they're not as big as you know fallout 3 or fallout 4's map but you have multiple different you know planets that you're going to that all have similar sized areas and they all have very diverse um landscapes and and enemies and stuff like that so it's very very interesting i I think this is still fine for this um obviously fans like you said christian are going to be clamoring for that full open world pokemon rpg but uh, i guess we have to keep waiting for it because uh arceus is not it yeah yeah i as and i was as i was saying looking at this picture i'm not too sure if i even want to go explore some of these areas yeah (laughs) like it looks pretty barren, some of the areas that are on display sometimes. So if it's like a little bit more condensed and there's more areas of interest uh, because it's more condensed, that's that's great. And I, and I think Monster Hunter does a really good job of these open world areas in their games. Like Monster Hunter World is kind of the only one that I could compare to because it's the only one that I've really played for a while. Um, but yeah, if, if they could do that with a Pokemon skin, I'm I'm down. So I, I'm not too bummed about this. I I was looking forward to com- a completely open world Pokemon game, um, but reading this, I'm not completely disappointed or turned off. Like I'm still definitely going to check it out and probably enjoy myself. And, and that's a good point too, Rowan. That like sometimes open world games doesn't necessarily translate to better games or better experiences. Like if it were to be completely open world, some segments might just feel too empty and people would have complained that like in this huge Pokemon game, it just feels kind of dead and like there's not a lot of things that make it feel alive. Mm-hmm. Whereas if it's just like these segmented sections that are kind of like these larger scale environments, then that you have more opportunities to like plant, you know, other Pokemon or like these like interesting locales make it feel alive, even though it's not actually open world. Yeah. yeah. Moving on to our next story, Riot patches out uh, forward slash all chat in a match made uh, League of Legends game. So I'm reading from Game Informer Josh uh, John Carson. Online games can be fun for people to get together and jam out some rounds of their favorite games with friends. However, sometimes playing with strangers can be stressful and occasionally off-putting or even abusive. Riot Games has undoubtedly had the latter issues in their popular MOBA League of Legends and is now taking more significant steps to curb inappropriate language during games. Riot announced in a blog post today that it's removing uh, all (laughs) chat function in the match-made games uh, of League of Legends, eliminating global written banter between players from both teams in the match. Here's part of what of uh, Riot's official statement regarding the change. 
while most of our focus around behavior behavioral systems in 2021 has been on gameplay based uh, behaviors like AFKing and it, inting. I never heard of that. What's that? Inting. <laughs> I <laughs> no, I don't know. I guess I'll search that up later. Um, we've heard from you that uh, verbal abuse has been a rising problem this year too. We're working on a number of changes to systemically address uh, this at both the league and riot levels. Uh, but one direct change you'll see soon is that in patch 11.21, we're disabling uh, all chat in match made queues. And I got to also just reiterate all chat, not it's not all chat, it's just the chat that allows you to communicate with all players uh, in a specific moment in the, in the matchmaking activity. Um, but yeah, you can still chat with your teammates, I'm pretty sure. And at the end of the match, you can talk to enemies by spamming your emotes, it looks like. Um, but at the beginning of the match, you can't just like throw horrible, terrible things at the enemy team and, and stuff like that. Um, it's not a perfect solution as John uh, Carson writes, but anything that makes pickup games a more pleasing experience is a step in the right direction. Riot has not announced when patch one uh, has not announced 11.21 goes live, but should happen in the next week or two. Um, Daniel, yes. what do you think about this change? Do you think it does enough? Do you think it's just a, a nice step in the right direction? Um, yeah, yeah, what do you think about them uh, removing all? I think chats? it's a uh, so. I would almost compare this to, you know, Twitch with how how the way Twitch has dealt with the the whole issue with hate raids and all of that stuff. It seems like this is a very similar thing like uh they're essentially saying, "All right, we can't figure out how to figure out how we filter properly and like get rid of words that we don't want to have in chat spammed and all of this stuff and derogatory things." So they're just like, "Oh, let's just turn it off." Like I hate this because like I, I grew up playing Halo 2 when I was a little kid. Halo 2 was so much fun, and part of the fun of it was cross uh, was uh, proximity chat. And the proximity chat, you could literally hear anyone within a certain radius of your player, and it became so much fun, just like you know Splinter Cell back in the day, where you grab someone from behind and you're holding them, and you can chat to them like as a spy. You're holding the merc, and you're like whispering in their ear, like "Hey, buddy, I got you." It's like that stuff is so like cool, and like I, I wish that stuff was still you know around nowadays. So I, I kind of wish they would just improve their tool sets um, for moderation, like. Uh, have a a chat filter, a pr- profanity filter, that kind of stuff. Like filter out the stuff that you know obviously is bad, and you know people are spammy. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's just, that's just that's like that that's the issue, right? It's it it's time, it's resources, it's figuring out how to implement those kinds of systems into a game, and not everyone has like the tool set to be able to do that. Yeah. So the easiest thing is just to have like a temporary fix, like just turning it off, which I mean is a temporary fix. So it's it's good in that regard, but it's bad in that like it doesn't really curb the issue or it, like it, it's just like leads to maybe less pleasant experiences. Like I guess like Dan was pointing out, like, you know, me- you can have memorable experiences with, you know, with Chad. And so I, it's it's like, I don't know. Is, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? It's well, it's a little bit of both at the end of the day. Yeah. Tough balance for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think it's a it's a good step. Hopefully, in the right direction that they continue to make a, a take a little bit more time and energy to uh, to combat this issue because it is a, it's a big issue for sure. And it's and I think they should focus more on it. Uh, I know it's a it's a hard one to tackle, um, but I think it's worth the the time and effort. And I and for me. The most most of the time where I get like a lot of harassment, it's it's with my own teammates. It's it's almost never the opposite team that's that's being mean to me. It's usually the people that I'm playing with. Like, yeah. yeah. So maybe they could. I'm, I'm, assuming, you never, I'm assuming you've never played Valorant, Row. <laughs> I have not actually. <laughs> one, of most, one of the most toxic games I've ever played in my entire goddamn life. Oh my gosh! For no yeah. reason. Why are people like this? <laughs> Why? I don't know. Really? That, that's. You have two kills and 17 deaths. What are you doing? Dude, I'll, I'll be playing well and I'm still getting trashed on. People. Like, why? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's that's the reason why I left uh, League behind. I tried, like, a couple of games and it's just... 
I can't I can't practice because no one is allowing me to practice. Mm. Oh, man. I mean I could against against bots, but as soon as I get into an actual game, yeah, it's uh, it's downhill from there. But uh, moving on to our next story, I'm going to try and move a little bit faster uh, for the next stories because we are going a bit long. But the next story is FIFA reportedly wants to charge EA one billion every four years to keep the FIFA name. So apparently, early this week, EA was considering changing the name of FIFA, uh, its giant football franchise, and now we may have a better reason as to why. The New York yeah. Times r- reports that there is a dispute between EA, the developer of the FIFA games, and FIFA, the worldwide fo- uh, football organization. The disagreement is reportedly over the cost of new and new re- revenue streams. So holy moly, that's a lot of money for every four years. Um, so do you think EA is going to keep that FIFA title, or do you think they're probably go the more money friendly route and change it? <laughs> Listen, I don't blame them if they did. Like yeah. FIFA is notorious, notoriously like we we give shit to EA, but FIFA <laughs> is notoriously one of the worst companies uh, out oh, there. Like man. they are they are hungry for money. Case in point, the next World Cup is in Qatar, and that is like there are tons of issues. It's like why is that there? Like I won't even I won't even get into that. So I I don't blame EA for for choosing to go uh you know dump those the assets that you normally would be using into and in, 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 like spending money on like the fifa name you know put that put that into like evolving your game like that, that that'd be clutch that'd be great i'll just uh, let i'll just let christian's comments speak for it because he's <laughs> our soccer expert so. <laughs> the usa is literally playing right now against costa rica for world cup qualifying and we'll win. the usa is winning go us yeah <laughs> Uh, moving on to our next story, PlayStation VR is celebrating five years of PlayStation gaming. Uh, the most played games globally are as follows, Rec Room, Beat Saber, PlayStation VR Worlds, Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim VR, and Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. They also announced that they'll be giving away some games in November, some free PlayStation VR games. Uh, I think three of them, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, next or November, so look out for those if you're a PlayStation VR player. You're getting some free games in next month. Heck yeah! Nice. I'm gonna hope that those are backwards compatible by the time PSVR two rolls around. Oh, rolls around. So I, I I've been racking in like a bunch of free games from PSVR that I just I don't want to connect all these wires or whatever. Yeah, but that would be nice. Yeah. I would like that too. <laughs> also, everyone go play Astrobot Rescue Mission. What are you What are you doing? That's like probably the best PSVR game out there. Yes. I- just from playing uh, Astro's Playroom, I mean, I can definitely see that happening. <laughs> Such a good game. Mm-hmm. Um, so, another story from IGN and Jared Moore. Epic Games has finally acknowledged that Fortnite's cloak and dagger style imposter game mode was inspired by Inner Slots Among Us. No one is surprised there, but it's nice <laughs> to hear them finally say it. I'm sure Inner Slot feels the same way. And there's an update to this article as well. Epic Games to have buried the hatchet with inner sloth in a new post on twitter the official fortnite account joked about how among us quote inspired us and teased a collaboration with inner sloth uh quote big fans fortnite account wrote we never got to talk about how you inspired us what do you think about working on something fun together sometime so that would be really cool i i, I think <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Christian, we, I see you shaking your head. We ain't forget, man. All this stuff <laughs> inspired. Like you, it's fun. You, we, we all know that you blatantly ripped it off and stole it and yeah. have totally avoided it in your slough altogether. But sure, now that we sure. you got like some negative press about that, it's finally after like months after it's time to roll around and like collaborate with them. I, I mean, at least they're talking now, which is yeah. which, for your sloth and getting this, this dub. Yeah, oh I mean, let's not forget Fortnite is essentially a, a stolen idea off of PUBG, you know, which That's PUBG true. stole off of other people who made Battle Royale games in the past. But yeah, it's funny. It's funny how video games work. It sure is. It sure is. You know what else is funny? Fortnite might be a movie someday. Fortnite feature film is being considered as a part of the plans for a new Epic Games Entertainment division. The movie... Uh, into scripted video programming was reported by the information uh, information and comes as epic revenues have been hit by its instability to expand further on iPhones and Android devices. A push to a push into the entertainment sector would bolster epic's uh, coffers 
and Fortnite movie has reportedly quote, already been discussed. So how how excited would you be what? for a Fortnite movie? What is a Fortnite <laughs> movie? Is it like like are they pulling in all these properties from all these Ready companies? Marvel, DC, everybody in, in the Fortnite movie? Like what is a Fortnite movie? I don't even know what that would be at this Dude. point. The last, maybe it's the second to last at this point, like one of the season cinematics was directed by the Russo brothers. True. And like I watched it, like it was actually like a decent it cinematic. Good. It was yeah. actually yeah, like, good. It, it was. Like they've they've got they've got oh my god. If they can get the directors, and I'm sure if they get the animation studio they partner with to tell like a decent story, oh my god, this is gonna be huge. Fortnite is already big. You're gonna have a movie on top of this? You know how many families are gonna go out to see the Fortnite movie? <laughs> I will not be there. I, there's no way I will be in that theater. But like, I, I'm cool. cool. Congratulations, yeah. Epic. All right. If yeah. if anyone's out there that lo- that's listening to the podcast, if you see Christian in the movie theater watching this movie, take a picture. I'm already going to see the Mario movie. I will not go see the <laughs> the Fortnite movie. Yeah, that that'll be that'll be a sight to see. Oh my God. But uh, it's Christian. I know you like Sable. You enjoyed that game. Am I am I correct? Apparently, I mean, yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought I, no, I thought ahead. you were talking to me. You're re- okay. I was, sorry. yeah, sort of. <laughs> I just wanted to say, did you know that Raw Fury is is potentially making a Sable game uh, or movie? <laughs> They're working on adapting some of their games for uh, TV and film. Uh, some of them include Sable, Nightcall, and Mosiac adaptations. So, how how excited would you be? Maybe not for a Fortnite movie, but for a Sable TV show. Do you think that would be Dude. a good adaptation? absolutely uh, the, from the little that i played as sable i need to get back to it because i had some projects to work on like that is right for like a, the exploration of like kind of a coming of age story like if it's a you know a one season show or like a, a like you know 80 minute movie i think that would have like that is so powerful honestly when i when i'm playing sable the first thing i thought of is like this should be a book and if you haven't played Sable, you won't know what I'm saying. But like a lot of it, like you get that introspection from the main character as if like we're reading a book, like you're, you're inside the, the character's head that you don't normally see in a lot of video games. Um, so, yeah, I, I would absolutely love this. Um, and moving on to our final story, Daniel. Yeah. Season eight of Halo Chief Master Chief Collection. The Master Chief Something Collection. Season like eight. That. It's here. <laughs> It's here, and it comes with 100 new tiers of customization options. They're coming to Halo 3, including an armor pack, back accessories, visors, and customization options for weapons and vehicles, and a new map. Oh my gosh, and there's a lot more that I didn't even mention. Daniel, what? how excited are you for um, Season 8? Very excited, very excited. <laughs> I cannot wait to play after the podcast ends tonight. Of course, more Master Chief Collection, but... Uh, yeah, one of the things I wanted to point out, though, like, so I, it was either last season or the season before we talked about at the top of the show, I, I kind of hinted at it a little bit. Halo CE's visuals had issues because of the gearbox port to PC on uh, on uh, PC on Windows Vista or whatever the hell CE came out on. And that's the version of the game that's in Master Chief Collection. They fixed those visual issues in Halo CE. This, in Season 8, they are fixing visual issues in Halo 2 Classic mode, which is the original graphics of Halo 2, because that was also grabbed from the Gearbox port of Halo 2 on PC. And the reason why they used those ports was because it's easier to port from PC than it is from an original Xbox game. So I'm looking at the screens where they show the before and after, and I'm like, yes like this is so much better like i'm so glad that they continue to improve upon this game and make it the best and definitive version of of every halo game um because like what we were talking about before it's important to keep the legacy while still you know moving things forward and i feel like they've done a really good job with that with adding new maps and stuff like that to games that are 15 years old so very excited Heck yeah. And to round out the PXN News of the Week, I have a very, very important announcement. Animal Crossing Direct is this Friday. Be there or don't if you don't care. But Bruce. I'm very excited. <laughs> Bruce. It's coming back. I'm so excited. Can't wait to see what they have to announce then. And we'll talk about that, of course, next week. Um, but Daniel. Yes. What you got for me? 
<laughs> well, I don't got Metroid Dread. I'm sorry, guys. I let you down. You, you both have played it. <laughs> I have okay. not. Uh, I played the Battlefield 2042 beta last weekend, though. Had a lot of fun with that, and they fixed a ton of stuff from the last time I definitely didn't play it. Uh, so <laughs> it, it was a much more polished experience, and it was really fun to play. One of the clips that I saw on uh, on Twitter that someone posted, insane. You jump off the skyscraper, and apparently if you use the grapple while you're you're falling from the sky, if you use the grapple... It, it eliminates all fall damage. So then you can literally propel yourself <laughs> across the map going super fast. And it's the best thing I've ever seen. I hope they don't patch it out because it's so funny to watch. Uh, and I've also been playing Back for Blood. Uh, I played with my buddy last night. Uh, we played quite a bit of it, actually. Um, played through the entire first act of it, uh, of the co-op campaign. Had a lot of fun with that. There are some you know issues with it and... Uh, I do feel like the responsiveness of the controls is definitely an issue. It doesn't feel like super smooth for a FPS. Like it's kind of very similar to the, the beta and alpha versions of the game. Like it just doesn't feel like super clean to use the sticks, uh, I guess, so to speak. I don't know how it feels on mouse and keyboard because I don't play on mouse and keyboard, but, uh, but yeah, uh, overall it's really fun. It's, uh, you know, back for blood, back to left for dead. So very excited, <laughs> nice. very excited. So it, it's it's a lot of fun. Nice, nice. Um, Christian. What do you got for me? I, I forgot that we like expanded this segment into like just other yeah. stuff in general. So I want I want to shout out that like um, I, last week I mentioned that I was playing Jet the Far Shore for review. Uh, since then I, I have. Finished that review and made the thumbnail. I did the wrote the article. I did the video on it, and that's out today. It dropped. I am very proud of it, and you uh, you should maybe consider checking that out. Jet review over on the Penultimate Conquest. A lot of put a blood into it. Anyway. Oh my god. <laughs> of course, we've. Of course, the, this is the hot new item that everyone's has been talking yes. about on Twitter and playing Metroid Dread. What? Which is uh. I, what i didn't even realize you had that up there bro like i saw christian yeah. with it earlier but he had it there the whole time it was there the whole what time? the hell he did as well he when i showed it rogue grabbed it I just oh like this. jeez right. and, and sorry. Good reason. In the back. <laughs> mercury mercury steam stream what's the developer mercury maybe it says on the gosh box. i'm blinking uh, i think it's mercury steam I want to get the name right before it's it. It's Mercury I, something for sure. I don't remember the, the last part of it. Merc- uh, Mercury Steam. Mercury Steam. Mercury Steam, yeah. Knocked it out of the freaking park. I was talking to my friend about Dread today, and like, it's not my favorite 2D side scroller. Obviously, Metroidvania, like the term Metroidvania comes yeah. from Metroid <laughs> games. It's, it's, not, it's not my favorite. I think my standard now is like Hollow Knight. Like, that game is a master's piece. But God, does Dread get close? The characterization of Samus is like one of my favorites that I've seen. Like she is such a badass. It is so cool. The segments where the game goes from 2D to like more 3D or like where you're like going into like stuff in the background, the boss fights, the atmosphere, like this game is keeps continues to bang. I can't wait till after this I'm going to make dinner and then continue to play. I have to try to space my playtime out a bit cuz I don't want to like rush entirely through it, but it's so hard to stop. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same mood. I'm also playing Metroid Dread uh, right now, and yeah, it's it's a fantastic game. And again, as someone who hasn't been a part of this franchise for a very long time, I've I played Fusion, I played a little bit of Zero Mission, but never to completion. Uh, this is definitely going to be my first Metroid game that I've I've beaten. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm having a blast. And as as Christian said, Samus is such a badass. I don't know if it's been this cool. I feel like she has, but. To this extent, I don't know if it's ever been she's ever been characterized this well, and it's it's just really cool to see her like you said in these cutscenes. There's there's so many that I want to shout out, um, but I don't want to spoil anything. But there's just so many moments that you're yeah. just like she's done this before. She just she just knows what to do. Um, but yeah, it's it's so cool to watch her even in, in gameplay. Like in the cutscenes, obviously there's a more a more character shown, but her just sliding around and just dodging the the emmy is ah, it's it's so cool it's fun to play the controls are really good there's a couple of things that that kind of upset me like uh there's sometimes you when you're stuck in a room it's some sometimes it's the most 
the most ridiculous thing to get you out of that room. Sometimes it's just you need to shoot the floor. And it's like, how am I supposed that's to know? that's Metroid. It's, it's insane. Apparently. <laughs> that's just apparently Metroid. I just ex- expect that stuff. But yeah, there'd be times where it's like, just shoot the floor. And it's like, how am I supposed to know to shoot the floor? There's nothing like like distinct to make me feel like this looks different than the one that I'm not supposed to shoot. So that, that could be a little frustrating sometimes. But when you get it, you're like, finally, I got it. Now I could move on to the next area. But uh, yeah, having a blast with Dread, and I cannot wait to see where it ends. The wildest thing about this is like, I think the level design, it, again, it's not my standard as Metro, right. for like Metroidvania games, but it's getting close to like, it's open world, and like there's all these like different places that you're traveling to. But it's smart in that there's kind of like almost a linear path that you're forced to go on through these locales based off like the um, whatever. Um, abilities you have or i guess in the case this case don't have yet that you kind of have to follow and like working your way through all these places that you've been there before and revisiting places with with new gadgets and it still leads you to like the next place you have to go is like so it's smartly really designed good. yeah Definitely, and i do want to yeah. shout out row go ahead no sorry i just wanted to shout out as well that yeah the body language of samus is like she like moves with like such confidence and like badass or like one of my favorite things to do is like parry and then the way yeah. she like slides into like to, to aim and you can just shoot like it's it's so cool dude so awesome play um, it Dan. yes play it. i need to play it i need to yes yeah i was just I, I i did say i was frustrated with the certain rooms just being like how, how do i get out of here and just no and that's what the game is like you said christian you're supposed to figure out it's supposed to be a little bit more difficult um, but I do agree that the level design is really, really, really good. Like, when you go to an area, it's like, oh, I, I turned on this switch, so I, I can't go back this way, so I have to keep going this way. But how do I get out of this room? I, there's, I don't, like, what do I do? So you just, like, search around, like, oh, I have to, go, have to do this, I have to do this. Like, oh, this is so cool. I love figuring it out, but I also hate it at the same time. But, yeah, super great. Play Metroid Dread. It's awesome. We want more games like this. So There's no bright it. orange glowing floor for you to shoot at. No, come on. Give me that, please. <laughs> <laughs> but moving on to our topic of the show, our game of the year contenders. Guys, the Game Awards are it's only like two months away. We're getting closer and closer to the Game Awards. This is crazy. It's crazy to think that we're close to the Game Awards. It's also crazy to think that 2021 is almost over. Oh but it's, that's that's crazy. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll start off with let's start off with games that we think are going to be on the list, and then we'll go into our personal game of the years, like games that we love personally. But maybe maybe they won't be on the list at uh, Jeff Keighley's awards. But um, yeah, uh, I'll start. I start with myself to give you if you guys weren't ready. Sure. Just in case. <laughs> so my first one that I have on here that I think will be on the game of the year list of Jeff Keighley's Game of the Words is Crash and Clank by Insomniac Games. Hmm. I feel like that's going to be on the list. I feel like it's a like a family friendly game as well. You always got to have one of them uh, that um, uh, a, a mass audience can enjoy. And I think it's really well done. I haven't played it personally, obviously. I'm definitely one of the people that was uh, on the outside looking in. But um, everything that I've seen seems fantastic. The technology, Insomniac always kicks it out, uh, knocks it out of the park with these types of games. They've been on a winning streak, so I think that that's going to be one of the games that's going to be nominated for Game of the Year. Ration and Clank, a rift apart for the PlayStation 5. I, I think that's a great nominee. I, I think it's going to be a harder sell to have that be like an actual Game of the Year winner when you mm-hmm. have like some some other titles right. that, I'll, that we'll get to. But yeah, that's, that's a good good pick. I could see that winning to like best like I don't know family game or. Uh, mm-hmm. Do they have that category uh, anymore? I forget if they do or not. I think, uh, I'm not sure. Or best animation or something. Yeah, I can see this winning other other categories and then mm-hmm. game of the year to to a separate game if that makes sense. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, Christian, what do you think? I think you're going to be out of your like. I don't uh, I personally agree with this, but you are out of your mind if you don't think Deathloop is going to be one of the <laughs> nominations. Like, people loved Arcane's new game. Mm-hmm. Uh. I understand it. I played it. I, I had a, a good enough time with it. Uh, to everyone saying that, like, when, when, like, oh yeah, Deathloop is one of my game of the years, I automatically think, okay, cool. This tells me you have not played The Forgotten City, which is far and away <laughs> way the way better like uh, time loop game. But like, Deathloop does have a lot of great stuff going for it, like its art design, its its VO, its like 
level design, its ga- its gameplay is really satisfying. So I it, I think it's a strong choice nominee for for game of the year. Certainly a contender. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Daniel. Like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Like a personal one and one that I totally could see being up there is Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart as well, bro. Like I love that game. I told you guys that last week i finally beat it after many months of putting it like aside i was like i have other things i'm doing but i love that game so much and uh i hope that they you know give credit to insomniac because i really i I feel like it's the best game i've played thus far this year um obviously i haven't played death loop yet um i know a lot of people are high on returnal so that might be another one uh uh talking straight at me (laughs) But like one that one that's coming up soon that we've just recently seen previews for Forza Horizon Five seems to be getting really good like previews right now. Obviously the game's not out yet; it's still a month away or so. But I'm very excited to play that as well because like I love the Horizon games and think they do an amazing job of uh, making a world that's just so living and breathable, and I love it so much. And yeah, Mexico, it's gonna be good. Good. That would be a hard sell, I think, for a lot of people for game of the year. Oh though. yeah, like it's racing it, game just it's more niche, right? Totally, yeah. totally. It will, it will, it will never be nominated. It, it it's going to be like more of a personal, you know. Yeah, thing. best racing but game. My, <laughs> mind-blowing stuff uh, coming out of like Forza Horizon, like uh, like previews on Twitter though. Like the, I think it was like the like the photo mode just looks absolutely mm-hmm. insane. How is that game like that good looking? Well, I, don't, and, I don't get it. And Christian, one of the one of the favorite parts that you you uh, spoke about uh Halo the Master Chief collection was Forge. You were excited about that seeing that on Twitter. Oh, yeah. And Forza Horizon 5 has a really cool like similar mode to Forge where you can build like custom mini games uh and they're just like wacky mini games you can create. So I feel like that could be, right. you know, something cool to check out as well. Dan but. In the shower, I was thinking about Forza either today or yesterday. I'm like, I don't know if I'm gonna like actually like get it. Yeah, ah, you just sold me. <laughs> yeah, Boom. Custom tracks, yeah, I'm in it, totally. It's, oh, it's so good, so good. All right, and how many more do you guys have for the official quote unquote um, game of the year list before we move into our personal ones? If oh, you have maybe any like maybe like two more. I kind of talked about both. Whoops, sorry. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. That's why. That's why I asked. So, if you have two more, I I'll say my two. Daniel, I mean, uh, Christian. I guess you could say your two, and then from Daniel on, we could just go into our personal ones and our from there on. So my uh, my two for the <laughs> that may be on your list as well, Christian. But I I think uh, Resident Evil Village might be on the list as well, totally. and. I, I maybe I'm crazy, but I think a Metroid Dread <laughs> might might get on the official Absolutely. list as well. Um, but yeah, RE Village, and I, again, I haven't played RE Village. Uh, Metroid Dread, obviously, you guys know I have been playing. Um, but yeah, I've heard great things about about both, obviously. <laughs> but RE Village, obviously, I'm on the outside looking in. Heard good things, so I think I could see that making it a Metroid Dread. I feel like can definitely make it as well kind of revamping the series as it did. So, yeah, those are my my last two for the official list. Ratchet and Clank, RE Village, and Metroid Dread were my my picks. Nice. I, I mean, I was going to mention Dread and Village as well. So because nice. you mentioned those, I'll, I'll bring up two other ones that I think okay. could have the possibility of getting nominated. I think Life is Strange True Colors, like, they're, yeah. that game was beloved <laughs> enough and good enough to potentially be... I don't... Winning is a separate discussion, but certainly being nominated, I think, has the the potential to to be in in the list of games. Usually, there's around like five, I think, games total. Mm-hmm. So I could totally see Life is Strange being in there. Uh, and then Dan mentioned it earlier, but I think Returnal. I think there's enough power there. People en- enough who like appreciated like the design and like uh, world building and, and, and atmosphere and gameplay of Returnal for it to be like, yeah, I, I can I can nominate this game. Whether it wins or not, I think is a, a, again another discussion, but certainly a contender for sure shout out hitman 3 but i don't think you're going to be nominated i have hitman 3 on my list too yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't think so yeah like like you said you i agree with both of you like resident evil village death loop uh and ratchet and clank were the three that i was instantly thinking of um being up there for the official list or whatever 
Um, so I definitely could see that. But yes, Hitman 3, I totally agree with you, Christian. That That's on my personal game of the year list. Like I, I think they IO did an amazing job of expanding what the Hitman games did, and that game is so good. Especially like... You think about, like, if you import all the content from Hitman 1 and Hitman 2 into Hitman 3, you get all of that content from Hitman 1, Hitman 2, and Hitman 3 in one game, and it's all, like, on the newest engine and all the new features and everything. It's so good. Also, the, mi- the mission in the mansion, like, <laughs> amazing. Yes. Very good. Uh, Dan, do you have any more uh, personal game of the year? So, I, I mean, obviously, guys, if we're talking about calendar year 2021, oh, here we go. <laughs> we have to talk about Halo Infinite. And yes, we still, it's not out yet. It's out in December, and it's probably not going to be a, a, on the eligible games for Jeff Keighley's Game Awards because of the timing of everything. But. In terms of calendar year 2021, there's not a more anticipated game for me, obviously, than this game. And I am just so freaking anticipating that campaign. That's honestly bigger than multiplayer, bigger than everything else. That campaign is what I want to see and like play and experience because it's been five or six years. Six years? Yeah. Six years since Halo 5. I just want to get that bad taste of Halo 5's campaign out of my mouth. Oh, man. 343, three. this game better be good. Yes. This game better be good for Daniel's yes. sake. Please. Please. Let's hope the infinite multiplayer is as good as 4, though. Oh! <sighs> Christian. Christian, I'm Christian. Kidding. I mean, am I? You're not <laughs> kidding. You're not kidding. That's the sad part. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to run through my personal one real quick. And if you guys, and Christian, of course, I'll let you go after. Um, but obviously, Life is Strange True Colors, obviously, is on my personal game of the year list. It's at my number one personal game of the year uh, right now still. Uh, I loved that game through and through. I think the characters are fantastic. Alex is amazing. I love the story. And obviously, I think it's the best in the series as well. And I just think, like most Life is Strange games, they always hit a personal, uh, emotional chord with me and it's like dang everything that you're saying right now i needed to hear this is like perfect timing amazing thank you so much uh don't nod so obviously that's at the top of my list everhood is a game that i keep bringing up for the game of the year stuff Mm. i want more people to play it it is so so good i loved it it's a great indie game uh it's i think it's the i think it's the first by the the studio uh it's kind of a uh, Undertale light, but the combat's definitely a bit different. But in terms of story and characters, it's very similar to Undertale. Number three on my list is Eastward. Still haven't beaten it, beaten it yet, but I'm, I'm loving it so far. I doubt that by the time I finish it, I'm going to hate it somehow. So Eastward, definitely on my list as well. Uh, Persona 5 Strikers, love that game, love Persona in general. And I think they did a great job bringing those characters into a completely different gameplay style and still making it still feel like persona so i love persona 5 strikers and metroid dread of course is also on my list having a blast with that and i think it deserves to be game of the, on the game of the year list this year so yeah those are my my five personal favorite ones uh Kier- christian take it away Kier- <laughs> craft and in, in twitch chat says 12 minutes i 12 minutes oh yeah I- I power to you if you enjoyed that game. <laughs> Christian, you know that I got freaking frustrated with it because we were on a freaking video call with each other and I'm like, how do I solve this? <laughs> and you're like, I don't know. Dude, we were on that call for like a solid, like, I don't know, like five, 10 minutes, like yeah. figuring out all these like oh possibilities for you to get to the next thing. Yeah. And all you had to like go back and do like one extra thing. That's so weird, dude. Yeah. That's it was, it was broken because every time, every time I did that scene, I went straight to the fridge to grab the picture and she interrupted me getting the picture. So it glitched out and didn't have the whole interaction there. So I couldn't progress the game. I was like, how am I supposed yeah. to do that? Like, Oh. 12 minutes man yeah it was interesting at least and i and i will just say everhood is 10.99 and that's canadian dollars guys imagine how cheap it oh. is in america just saying it's yes. like six bucks or something i, forget, I don't know eight bucks uh but yes Chris, sorry uh what yeah. are your personal 
happens. Legit, I have like three game of the year contenders right now, and if I'm thinking about it, more, it's more like two. But I, I want to. Th- I'm not done with it yet. But I, I legit want to throw Metroid Dread in in that conversation of game of the year contenders. Like this, we've already talked enough about like how fantastic this game is. So I won't belabor the point there. But it's a very, very good video game that is that is worth your time and and money. Uh, shucks to all those people on on Twitter being like, oh, sixty dollars. Like, com- let's compare games. Like, what are you doing? To be, like, this to be fair, it was one guy being really stupid, <laughs> and everybody pooped very, on him. Very fair. Yeah. You're, you're <laughs> really but yeah, um, silly, silly. Two, another game that I continue to uh, press on everyone uh, is The Forgotten City. Like, that game legit probably has the best narrative game that I've experienced this year. and Or, in fact, even in the last few years, like, the design of how you unfold the, the narrative of figuring out the mystery of The Forgotten City is one of my, like, my favorite games. Like, I, it's, it's in my top 100 of all time now. Um, and so is my number one pick, I think, so far, which is Returnal. It is hard to top that game for me. I, I'm sorry. I know it's very like PS phone, like Tony <laughs> fanboy of me, but like legit, like that is my type of game. Like House Mark, I love you so much. That gameplay is so tight. The atmosphere, the world of Atropos is like curiosity driven and fascinating to me. Like doing analysis on the story w- with my friend Hugo on Large Popcorn was like the most fun I've had just talking about this game. Um, and then just like, I guess the sound design and score, like th- when I think of like, game of the year i'm thinking of masterclass and all these levels of game development and i think for me returnal just hits all those in strides and just and it just speaks to me on like the games i'm interested in so that's why i think it's goty for me nice. yep like i already talked about ratchet that's on my personal hitman 3 i already talked about that resident evil village is probably that's the game that was my game of the year before i finished ratchet and clank and i love that game so much and I was one of the ones like, man, why are we going back to first person again? You know, Resident Evil 7 was great, but like, was it Resident Evil? But Resident Evil Village, fantastic. I absolutely love that game. The boss battles were all really cool. Very original. Um, And even the replayability of that game is so good. And yeah, I love it. Give me some more Resident Evil Capcom. Keep it coming. I should play Village. I I skipped it this this year. Should go back. Definitely. Definitely. I have to play four on my quest first. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be, oh, that'll be it. You'll have to let me know how that is. Will do. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that you would like to say before we wrap up the show today? What's up? (laughs) Drink water. Drink water. I should, yes. Thank you. (laughs) I will get on that. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for joining us live on YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter, as well as podcast services everywhere, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Stitcher. Thank you, Sean. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't thank him. He's not here. <laughs> it's not even written here. I was like, my name is, it says, thank you, Roro. And I was like, okay, I can't say that. I got to say one of these guys' names. And I say the person who isn't here. Okay, anyways. Thank you, gauge. Christian. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I could have said gauge too. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Daniel. I'm Rashan. This has been Podcast PXN. Later will be greater. Much love. Watch Dune next week. <laughs>